Well, good morning. Hey, everybody. So my name is Owen. I'm on staff here at PAC. And uh, I have to let you know this morning that uh, in junior high, I was uh, quite the ladies' man. So, uh, <laughs> now you're all li- laughing because you know that is a clear and patently false statement. Uh, and you probably know that for one of two reasons. Some of you, you probably know that because you know that in junior high, no one is a ladies' man. <laughs> it's the most painfully awkward time of my life. Uh, but then you also know if you've met me and talked to me for more than 30 seconds, you're like, oh, and you're way too big of a nerd. And so it's true. I was, I was definitely not a ladies' man in junior high, though I was a hopeless romantic. But it never really quite worked out for me, and I have some, uh, a little bit of photographic evidence as to why that may have been the case. So that's me fanny pack and all. That's grade eight. Let me just clarify that. Yeah. So that's my younger brother in the stroller. And uh, yeah, so grade eight, right when you're supposed to start ramping up and uh, become like more settled in your skin, there's me. So uh, you please, please put that down now, Judy. <laughs> uh, thank you. But so I, I was a hopeless romantic from as long as I can remember. And so there's always, especially starting junior high, through high school, there's always like a girl that I liked, right? And I would follow this pattern. On reflection on it, I was like, oh, I would do the same thing over and over. So I would like a girl, and then I wouldn't do anything about it. (laughs) (laughs) But then I would realize that nothing was happening. So then I'd like try and spend more time with her. I'd go where she spent a lot of her time. I'd become friends just by proximity and build a relationship slowly but surely till we actually became quite close friends and then I would do nothing and nothing would happen. (laughs) And so this pattern, it followed me with every girl that I liked through junior high all the way up until high school. And so it was kind of this like relational permanent dry spell. It was this relationship wilderness that I was in until I was headed off to college. So I'd taken a year off after high school to work, and I got to build some amazing relationships, some good friendships in the church, serving alongside people there. And there was this girl that I really liked and wanted to date and all of these things. And we're starting to build that relationship thing. And the trick, though, was that I was going to school in Calgary in the fall. And so I was like, well, this is clearly not going anywhere. But then I found out that she was actually going to move to Calgary for work at the same time. And I was like, sweet. It's perfect. God's clearly ordained this. So, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so then we get to Calgary, and I'm like, you know what? I've been following this script relationally for all my life, so I'm going to change it now. I'm going to change it. I'm going to actually intentionally invest, so I intentionally spent time with her, pursued her, spent time with her one-on-one, spent time with her friends, got, invited her to spend time with my friends, which didn't work so well, something about smelly college guys' dorms or something. And I actively pursued and engaged with this girl, and, and nothing happened still. And I didn't get it, because at this point, it was like, this is what I want, God. Why are you not letting this work? Now, I want to kind of pause for a moment here, because I'm kind of making light of my singleness and making it into a joke, and I want you to know if you're here this morning, you're single, your singleness is not a joke. We, uh, as the church, not just PAC, but historically the whole church, we've done a, an unfortunate job with our single people at times because we, we hold marriage up in a very high pedestal, and rightfully so, right? It's this sacrament, it's this God-ordained covenant, it's this really important part of the church life, but at times we've pushed it just a little too high on that pedestal and it's become an idol, And when we do that, we create damage. And so we have the conversations like, well, if you could just get married, or we really need to find you a good guy. Meanwhile, we're damaging the single people in our lives. And so if you're single, whether you're single or not, you need to know that your value and your impact for the kingdom are not based on your marital status. Okay? So let's just get that to the side. But in college there, in my singleness, in this wilderness of relationship that I found myself, I was frustrated with God. I didn't get it. I was so 
upset. Why is this not working, God? And so often in our lives, we can find ourselves in some sort of wilderness in our lives, and it shows up in different ways in all of us. Maybe for you, you've accepted this job and this role with the promise that you would be able to move up through the ranks of the organization and get raises and have leadership potential and all these things, and it's just never happened. And so now 10, 15, 20 years later, you're stuck in the same job, and you're frustrated. You're like, I don't get why I'm here. Or maybe you've had this God-ordained dream that you've been given And it's amazing, it's beautiful, and the ideas you have are powerful, and people have affirmed you in this, and they're saying, yeah, get that out there, and it just never happens. It dies on the cutting room floor every time, and it's not taking off like you thought it would, and you don't understand why God isn't bringing your dreams to reality. Or maybe you've experienced a significant loss in your life. Maybe a loved one or something that was core to your identity. And now all of a sudden you're left wondering, who, I don't, I don't, who am I now? I'm lost. Why am I here? Why did you do this, God? Why, why am I here? And so it's in those moments that we fall into this wilderness where we feel abandoned and isolated and lost. But what if it's in the wilderness of your life that God wants to meet with you? What if it's in the wilderness moments of your life that God wants to equip and release you for more? And in those moments of wilderness, it can be very easy for us to ball up our frustration and our hurt and our anger and our pain into this one raging question, why did you lead me here? Why did you lead me here? Why did you do these things to me? I don't get it. And maybe God has something for us in that wilderness. So in this series on Cluttered, we're talking about bringing order out of chaos and how God does that in our lives, and we're looking at the book of Mark. And so we're going to read this morning Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 9. It says this, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and the angels attended him. So here in the story, in the Gospel of Mark, we have this moment where Jesus, he moves from this high commissioning moment, this affirmation moment, where the Father says, this is my son, I love him. He is my son. His spirit descends on Jesus, and then right away, the spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness. And it's this weird tension for me. As I've grown up reading this passage, I didn't get it. It's like, okay, so we're moving from this moment of affirmation, confirmation, and embrace all of a sudden to seeming abandonment and exile and struggle. Like, why why did Jesus do that? Why did the Spirit do that in him? But I think there's more to, than just moving from embrace to abandonment here, right? So yes, there, there's this tempting, there's this trial that Jesus goes through, but there's more behind the scenes going on because it says that the angels kept him and guarded him, so the Spirit of God was with him. He was not abandoned. In fact, God was meeting with him there. And further, The moment Jesus comes back out of the wilderness is the moment that Jesus' ministry on earth is released and the kingdom of heaven comes. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is now as soon as he comes up out of the wilderness. And so we see this pattern a few times in the Old Testament where the wilderness is where we meet with God. There was prophets in the Old Testament that were constantly going out into this wilderness to meet with their heavenly father. And so we see it in Jeremiah chapter 2. 
and says this, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. So we see this picture of following God into the wilderness, chasing after him into this wilderness experience, much like a love-struck junior high kid following the girl he likes around, right? This is the picture of Jeremiah, where Israel is now following God into the wilderness and are growing in intimacy with him. And then, in the book of Hosea, if you haven't read the book of Hosea, please do. It's honestly one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it is this prophetic word from God that is lived out in the life of Hosea. And it's this metaphor for God's relationship with the nation of Israel and by virtue of that, God's relationship with us. And so if you're not familiar with the story, God tells the prophet Hosea to marry this woman, Gomer, and she is unfaithful to him. And so in chapter two, there's this declaration where Hosea is cutting Gomer off, and it's a metaphor for the way that God, when we run away from him, when the nation of Israel runs away from him, him, he cuts us off and sends us into the wilderness. And it's an isolation. It's a cutting off for the purpose of redemption. And then in verse 14, he says this, Therefore I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. So this story of Hosea, there's this sense of isolation and punishment in the wilderness, but there's also the sense that this is the place where I'm going to meet with the nation of Israel. This wilderness that I'm sending you to is the place where I'm going to meet with you. And so really we see kind of two ways that we end up being, going into the wilderness. So there's two ways that we end up in the wilderness. The first is that sometimes we run to the wilderness. So this is voluntary. This is where I am choosing to go to the wilderness to follow after God. Uh, we see that historically in, in characters like the Essenes or the ascetic monks of the, of the days of old where uh, they would literally just go out into the desert and do weird things like standing on poles for 30 days at a time for the purpose of developing their intimacy with God and then to be released for something more when they came back. The Essenes especially, they would go into the desert and isolate themselves from the rest of their community so that they could be with God and then go back into their community to transform and bring revolution. And so sometimes we follow God into the wilderness and we run to him there. We run to something that we're looking for in the wilderness. The first uh, ministry position I had was in this little town called High River in Al southern Alberta. And uh, after a couple of years, a man and I, my wife, we, we had started to feel like God was calling us out. And so we responded to that, and we we're like, okay, we'll, we'll follow you out of this security, this place that we love. And so we had the conversation with my lead pastor, and we kind of came to this agreement that we'd start looking for a new ministry position. And uh, over the next coming months, we'd probably find something, and then we'd move on. And we had this agreement that we could stay as long as we needed, but we could also go when we needed. In my heart and mind, I was expecting like, yeah, month and a half, two months. Like, I'm a pretty likable guy. I could probably find a job. A whole year passes. And I had interviewed with about 15 different churches. Now, I know for some of you guys that may not, you know, like, whatever, I interviewed for like 15 jobs every other day. But in ministry, it's a little, that's a little bit weird that you go that long and interview with that many churches without anything sticking. Until finally in May, so just coming up to the end of the ministry year in the ministry calendar, uh, I was interviewing with this one church. So it was a friend of mine who was vacating his position on good terms. The church was healthy, it was growing, it was exciting. I, was ex I liked the people that were there. I was excited to be there. My friend had already talked to his leadership and kind of teed me up as a good successor for his role. And so I was stoked. I was like, this is clearly what God wants for me, right? This is the wilderness thing that, this is what we've been following Jesus through the wilderness for. This is, this is it. And 
So we interview, first round of interview, and it comes back, hard no, right away. You're not the guy. I was so mad. I was like, are you kidding me? Because at that point, we had announced our resignation at the church. At the end of June, we were done, hard and fast, no matter what happened. Our house had already sold. We had nowhere to go, no job to land in. And this prime apple of jobs, God just kind of like, eh, it's not for you. Like, what are you doing? Don't you know that's what it was supposed to be? And so sometimes when we run after God into the wilderness, just because we're chasing him there doesn't mean that it's necessarily comfortable or easy. And so in those moments of angst, in our wilderness moments leaving High River, I learned a dependency on my Heavenly Father that I had never known before. I learned to trust him in ways I'd never trusted him before because it's really hard to not be dependent on God when you don't have anything else. <laughs> and so we go, okay, I guess you gotta figure it out, and he did. And he, at the last minute, he led us to where he had us to go. So sometimes when we run to the wilderness voluntarily, we are running to something. But sometimes when we run to the wilderness voluntarily, we're actually running away from something. Sometimes we'll isolate and cut ourselves off because there's something going on in our life that we're like, I don't like that anymore, I wanna get away from it, and we'll run away to the wilderness. And the trick is, is that that thing that you're running away from, it is going to be there no matter what when you come back to it. It's going to wait for you. The benefit is that if you run to the wilderness in earnest and you go to be with God in those moments, in those days, you will come back better prepared and equipped to actually deal with that thing in your life that is causing you to run away. So sometimes we've run to the wilderness. Either we run to God in the wilderness or we've run away from something, but sometimes we voluntarily go there. And sometimes we are led into the wilderness. Sometimes we are sent there involuntarily. We do not want to go, but we're sent anyway. So uh, if I'm very honest with you, as I was preparing this week, I was wrestling a lot with uh, sharing some of our story here because... uh, for our family, some of the wounds I'm gonna share with you, they're a little fresh. And so there's a few things that I was concerned about. One, I didn't wanna paint myself as this kind of martyr hero because it's not about me. Um, I also didn't wanna damage the bride of Christ. I didn't wanna tarnish the name of the church as a whole. Um, And frankly, I I don't particularly feel like emotionally bleeding out on you all. But as we processed, we felt that, talking it through with Amanda, we felt that our story might help you in your story in your wilderness moment. So, before, just before we came to pack, our family was very much led into the wilderness. Uh, without warning, as in a total surprise, I suddenly had to find a job. While Amanda was six months pregnant, we had our two small kids and our home. And uh, we were left hanging, didn't see it coming, weren't prepared, and all of a sudden, we're in the wilderness. And the challenge that we've found in our life, being a pastor, being in ministry, is that when you transition, when you move jobs, you can't just go and get a job at the church down the street. It doesn't quite work that way. And so in one fell swoop, we lost our home, our security, we lost our community, We lost some friends along the way. We lost a lot. And for me personally, I lost something that I held as a piece of my identity and self-value because this is what God has called me to do. And if you are saying I'm not good at it, what does that mean about me? And so it was a fairly... emotionally shattering experience that we went through. Uh, At one point during this wilderness time in our lives, Amanda, my wife, she just looked at me and she's like, I don't don't know who you are anymore. And the truth was that I didn't know who I was anymore. I was lost. 
And there's this whole range of emotions that you go through in moments like that when you're in the wilderness and you don't know why. But I was primarily angry. I was angry with the people that had made these decisions on our behalf, but I was also very angry at God. That question, why did you lead me here, was the question that came over and over and over and ramped up more and more angrily. But there's also a ton of grief because we lost. And for me personally, I, I started to spiral into a depression because I was just, I, I didn't know who I was. I was entirely and utterly lost and scared. And so we're in this wilderness and I don't get it. And then mercifully, about a month later, I'm sitting at a small round table in Calgary, drinking terrible coffee, (laughs) emotionally bleeding out to these two perfect strangers who then laid their hands on me and prayed for me and my family and told me about this place called Prairie Alliance Church where they thought I might be a fit. Now, meeting Nathan and Chris uh, was an experience. Um, (laughs) But it didn't solve all the problems right in that moment. There were still months of chaos and fear and unknown and hurt, and there's still hurt that we're still processing today, which is why I was nervous about sharing this story. But through that experience, our trust in our Heavenly Father grew even more. I thought I I couldn't trust God more than I already did, and lo and behold, he shows me up. And Amanda and I, we can honestly say that if we had not been led into that wilderness experience, we would not have been open to the hand of God, and we probably wouldn't have chosen to move to Manitoba. We, (laughs) We love you guys, but we probably wouldn't have chosen it. We're so glad that we're here, though, because now we have seen that this is where Jesus wanted us. And through... (laughs) And we can now see, too, that through our various wilderness experiences that God was preparing us for things that we had no idea we would need to be prepared for. Why did you leave me here? Why, why, why did you leave me here? I don't, I don't get it, God. In the wilderness, that's the cry of our hearts. Whether we've chosen to go there or not. Why? Why? And the answer is always two things. One, he wants to build intimacy with you. He wants you to draw closer to him. He wants you to trust him more. He wants you to love him more the way that he loves you. And the second thing that he wants to do in you is he wants to equip and release you for what he has next for you. The way that Jesus stepped out of the wilderness and stepped right into the start of his ministry, releasing the kingdom of heaven on earth, that is what he wants for you in the wilderness. He wants to equip and release you for more. So for you this morning, what is your wilderness? What is that place in your life where you ask that question, why did you, why did you leave me here? I don't get it. Don't hurry through it. Don't run away from it because the wilderness is God's workshop where he wants to draw you closer to him and release you from more. In the wilderness, you're not abandoned, you are not alone. And in those deepest wilderness moments of your soul, you are safe, he is on your side, and he is shaping you for what is coming next. So what wilderness are you walking through? What wilderness are you in right now in your life? Or what wilderness have you walked through in the past that you still don't have all the pieces of? Because he wants to meet you there. 
Why don't you stand with us? And in a moment, the team's going to lead us in worship again. And this is the moment where he wants to meet with you in your wilderness. So come and meet with him.